Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna read a very different passage of scripture for you. Uh, Matthew chapter one, beginning at verse one. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren, and Judas begat Phares and Zerah of Tamar, and Phares begat Esram, and Esram begat Aram, and Aram begat Abinadab, and Abinadab begat Nason, and Nason begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab, and Rechab. Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. And Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon begat Rehoboam, and Rehoboam begat Abia. Abia begat Asa, Asa begat Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat begat Joram, Joram begat Ozias, Ozias begat Jotham, Jotham begat Achaz, Achaz begat Ezekias, Ezekias begat Manassas, who begat Amon, and Amon begat Josias, and Josias begat Jeconius and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. After they were brought to Babylon, Jeconius begat Salathiel, Salathiel begat Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel begat Abiad, Abiad begat Eliakim, Eliakim begat Azor, Azor begat Zadok, and Zadok begat Achim, and Achim begat Eliad, and Eliad begat Eleazar, Eliezer begat Mathan, and Mathan begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. So all the generations uh, from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David till the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away to Babylon are 14 generations. You know, I don't know if you maybe do like I normally do when I get to those passages, but I either skim through them or skip them. Those begats, I'm like, I can't even pronounce most of the names that are in there. And even if I could, what is this even in the book for? But I believe that Scripture is so inspired that everything that's in there is there for a reason. And some of it we may not quite understand. And so as I ponder these begats, I, 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 I have a few things that, 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 that I want, want us to take a look at and glean from this passage of Scripture that Matthew used to open up his gospel and begin telling the Christmas story. And the first thing that you really notice as you look at some of these, is that there were a lot of scandals in Jesus' family tree. If you look at them, you see early this story of Judas and Tamar. And if you remember that from the Old Testament, Tamar was supposed to marry one of Judah's sons and... That son died and then he was supposed to give her to the next son, but he was just kind of holding off on that. And so she pretended to be a prostitute and slept with Judah and took his staff, basically his ID card during the time. And when he was about to have her stoned for being pregnant, because she was betrothed to his next son, that she sent his ID card back and say, I'm pregnant by this guy. And then he backs off, well, maybe we don't need to stone you after all. That's in Jesus' family tree. A lady named Rahab. The harlot. 
And Har- right, Rahab was, was one that when, when you get to Hebrews, it tells us that she was one who had great faith. Uncommon faith among people that weren't even the people of God. But she was brought into the family of God because of her great faith. And you look at that and you see, you never know where great faith and great anointing and great power and great miracles are going to come from. Don't look at somebody and think because of their background that they're beyond. Well, God has a way of taking the most scandalous people and the most unexpected people and because of faith and grace and His power, working it into His plan. You see Ruth, you, 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 you see Bathsheba. It tells us that David, the king, begat Solomon with another man's wife. See, I like how Matthew tells this story. Matthew doesn't give the kind of testimony that we, we, we normally have in church. We normally give the edited version of the testimony. We want to scrub it up and clean it up and we don't want to tell all the mess that God saved us from out of. We don't want folks to know that amazing grace saved a wretch like me. But Matthew tells it like it is that God used David and his mistake and all of his sin. That God's redeeming power and His grace is so strong that it's able to take the worst mistake of David's life and redeem it for His purpose. I wonder what our testimonies might sound like if we gave an unedited version. If we said what really God saved us from. If we were able with boldness to declare this is how strong God's grace is. You you want to understand how strong grace is? Look at the real mess that we were in where God reached down and saved us. Maybe if we started giving our unedited testimony then we might have a little bit more faith to understand that there is no one beyond the hope of grace. There is no one beyond the reach of grace that God is able to save the chief of sinners that God is able to save those that are the most hopeless and he's able to take even the worst mistakes of our life and redeem them by his grace look at it Jesus came (coughs) through a family tree with all of these problems Sin, scandal, harlot, mistakes. But God worked all of it into His plan. I think the other piece that we can get from this story is that God was faithful in every generation. I'm sure there's some of those 42 generations that Matthew goes through who thought that the promise was forgotten. That thought that maybe that the prophecies that were given had been forgotten by God. That God's people were abandoned. Maybe it was around that time where they were carried away into slavery. They were no longer the royal lineage of David. They were slaves in Babylon. Maybe it was during the dark times when not a prophet, not a move of God, nothing had been heard since the close of Malachi and 400 years went by and nearly a dozen generations without hearing anything from God. God's people were conquered by the Greeks, then the Romans. They were subject to a cruel, heathen, idolatrous empire. And maybe some of those generations thought that God had forgotten His promise. As I look at that, I wonder what what time that we have been here, what time even this church has been here in comparison is but an infant to the 42 generations 
between Abraham and Christ. But if God was faithful then, God is faithful today. Those last few generations, Jacob and Joseph, they received the promise. Jacob, who was the step-grandpa of Jesus. Joseph, who was Jesus' stepdad. They received the promise. But they received the promise not because of their faithfulness, but because of a promise that God gave to David. God said to David, I'm sending the Messiah. I am sending the King of Kings through your family. And generations had passed. 28 since David. And then God's promise was fulfilled. Every generation was a step closer, but maybe didn't even realize it. That God was still working. That God was still moving. That God was still faithful. And that God remembered the promise He made to David. And kept that family. And kept all of those people whose names we can't even pronounce. As steps toward the coming of the Messiah. I wonder what prophecies have been given over this church. Amen. Prophecies that maybe have been forgotten. Mm-hmm. Prophecies that maybe we'd have to talk to Sister Louise or Brother Fest to even stir up the memory of. That these are the words that God was faithful to keep. Till the end. Think about this. God kept his promise. I wonder how many grandpas and grandpas and aunts and uncles of generations maybe that have gone on to heaven, prayed over their family. And some of those members of their family aren't in church today. Maybe some of those members of those families are waking up with a hangover this morning. Waking up addicted. Waking up hopeless. But there was a grandma that's prayed over them. And I'm going to tell you that God is faithful. And we haven't seen the end of what is going to become of this holler and what is going to happen from those prayers and that God is going to answer the prayers that were prayed by those that have went on and they cried tears on this altar and they prayed over this holler and they prayed over their family and they prayed over their community and there's folks out there that maybe they're backslid or maybe they're not even saved yet but they've got a bullseye on their back from the Holy Spirit who has a call on them, who has an anointing on them who has a gift in them for the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance and God is going to call them out and He is going to be faithful to the prayers of Zelfi and others that have went on. God is going to answer those prayers and the faithfulness of God will be seen through the generations that God is faithful and that God does not forget what He promised. We haven't seen the end of the purpose of God. God is not done yet. Don't give up praying just yet. 
Don't give up on that family member just yet. Cry a few more tears. Pray a few more prayers. Agonize and call out their name. Plead the blood of Jesus over them. Pray the Holy Spirit over them. Don't let the situation that they're in, the mess that they're in, discourage your heart because it might be a little while from when the promise is given until when it's fulfilled. But understand this, that if Jesus said it, that if the Lord spoke it, that if the Holy Spirit Spirit breathed it, that it will come to pass. God was faithful. I wonder how many steps that we've taken. We're moving closer to the promise and we don't even realize that we're on the brink of it. They were on the brink of it because in all of it, God had a plan and God had a time. It was Matthew looking back and saying, you know what? It was 14 generations from here to here and here to here and here to here. Total of 42 generations. From Abraham to David, David to Babylon, Babylon to Christ. 14 generations each. That God was working a master plan in His time. Paul said, in the book of Galatians, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son. There is a time with God. A time of visitation. A time when the Holy Spirit moves. A time of harvest. A time of revival. There have been times of planting and there's been times of barrenness and times of winter. But all of it are the seasons and times that are appointed of God. And when the fullness of time has come, I believe that we have come to the time of harvest. I believe that we have come through times of barrenness and times of tribulation and times of planting and we've went forth sowing in tears but we will come forth reaping with joy. We have been been in the times of barrenness where we wondered where is the God of our fathers but we are coming in the time of visitation. We are coming upon the time when the Holy Spirit is going to bring the full weight and the full power of the prayers and the tears and the anointing of the generations that have come before us and will not be great because of our own stature but because we stand on the shoulders of giants. We stand on the shoulders of those that have gone before and God will raise us up in power and in anointing to touch and see revival and to see the harvest in this last hour. When the fullness of time was come. I stand here and believe that it's not because I'm pastor. It's not because of me. But it's because of the hour that we are in. That we are going to see what God has promised. And it's not because of anything other than it's God's time. And you're going to see some of the young people and some of the kids are going to begin to be poured out of the Holy Spirit. And be you've got to be open to receive because the Holy Spirit might have a young baby laying hands on you with the anointing of the Holy Ghost and see healing and the gifts of the Spirit. Not because of the talent in the kid, but because of the timing of God that we stand in the last hour when He said, I will pour out of My Spirit upon all flesh. And it is that time that the Lord spoke of and that the prophecies are for and that the prophets of old long to see. It is that time that this church was planted for. It is that time that six decades of prayers and tears and sowing have went forth because we stand in the time when God says it is now. It is the last hour of harvest. We stand at that generation. And if Joseph could have looked at his spiritual watch, he would have said, it's been 14 gender. It's about time. We stand when it is the moment when God says it's for now. The prayers have been for now. The time for your family to be one is now. The time for this community to experience revival is now. It is that time. 
And when they came to that moment, everything God had been setting up, mm -hmm. all, of, all, all of the stuff that had happened in the world, was God set up for the coming of Christ. Mm. You know why the Greeks conquered? The Lord brought all of that so everybody spoke the same language. Mm -hmm. So that when Paul went and he preached Christ, he could go and preach in Greek and everybody understood the message of the Gospel. Before Alexander the Great, every, every city spoke a different language. Mm -hmm. But God set it up for the Gospel. Then the Romans came. They conquered. You know why God had them come and conquer? They set up roads so you could travel anywhere in the empire. They brought peace so that there weren't raiders and pirates that would, uh, that, that, that would plunder and steal and kill so that the gospel could be preached throughout the world. Paul said, when the fullness of time was come, there are some things that we look at and we think, how could this be happening in our community? But maybe it's a setup from God. That God is trying to turn our eyes away from government, away from money, away from the economy, and realize that we cannot have our hope and our trust in man, but that God is the one that is our provider. That God is our source. That God is able to provide for His people. That even if all the coal mines shut down, that God has a way of raining manna down from heaven and sending a breeze that brings in a pile of quail that God is not limited to, He's not limited to what's going on on Wall Street. He's not limited to who's in the White House. But that God Almighty is more powerful. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is the Lord our provider. The Lord our healer. And that if we will turn our eyes to the Lord that we can understand that all of these things are so that we have our, our focus on a kingdom that is heavenly. That we take our eyes off of this world and we look to a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. When the fullness of time has come. I believe that today we are seeing the beginning of what is going to be a great outpour of the Holy Spirit. That we are seeing a cloud the size of a man's hand. That we are seeing some signs of God beginning to move. And, 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 and if you're not looking for it, you might miss it. You, might not, you not, might not be prepared and ready because you don't have your eyes on what God is already doing and what is already coming together. But I'm here to tell you that God is beginning to do a work. And He is beginning to do a work in this community and in this church and in the homes. And that there's some sinners that are under conviction. And that there's some backs letters that are being drawn back and that God is working and God is stirring and God is drawing His people and that we stand on the brink of it. We stand on the edge of it. We stand at the fullness of time. God did it. And if you look at all these generations, you have to say it was the faithfulness of God. That brought it all Amen. to pass. Great is His faithfulness. Lord, Your mercy is great. To a thousand generations. We stand. And have to see. It's the faithfulness of God that we're here. If you give your unedited testimony. You probably could say, there's some times I try to backslide. There's some times I try to give up. I try to throw in the towel. But God is faithful. God is faithful. When we look at this, this genealogy, we have to understand that everything that we receive, everything that God does, is because of His faithfulness. David dropped the ball. But God redeemed it. Judah made a huge mistake. But God used it. 
We've all fallen and sinned and rebelled and backslidden. But God's grace restored it. And that we are here, each one of us, we have our own grace story that it is God's faithfulness. This church has its own grace story. It's God's faithfulness. There's probably some times that some of you folks that are working and giving and supporting and staying faithful thought, should we just give up? Would it be easier? But you held on. Because God is faithful. And the Lord brought you through some dark hours. And God brought you through some painful hurts. And God brought you to this point. And it is the faithfulness of God. And we have to understand that God wasn't just faithful just to sustain us. But that God was faithful because He was going to bring about a great salvation. And a great miracle. And God's faithfulness through all of these generations was to glorify His salvation. In Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I want you to bow your heads and.